All right, welcome to week 10, 11, 10, 10. It's lecture seven, <laughs> we'll go with that. And uh, today I'm gonna cover aggregates and joins. Um, the first part I'm gonna talk about is aggregates, which picks up pretty much wherever I left off last week. Uh, last week I was talking about simple queries. In other words, you're grabbing columns from one table with a where clause to limit what you're pulling back. Aggregates, is one of the more powerful functionalities in SQL. It's a series of functions that lets you do math. And by it lets you do math, it means it'll actually you know, do stuff like averages, sums, counting, uh, min, max, it'll do it for you. So you don't have to, you know, you know how to calculate an average, right? Sum it up divided by total number of records. Well, this will just do it for you so you don't have to think about it. Um, Aggregate functions are used in the field selection area. Um, they're normally paired with one or more display fields. If you just do aggregate and it gives you a number, it's usually not very meaningful, unless all you're doing is getting a count of rows. Um, if you do have a display field, you must do a group by. I'll be dem demoing this before I talk about joins. Today, the demo will be coming in two pieces. So, common aggregates. The most common ones you'll see is count which lets you count the number of rows. Min max, which finds the minimum or the maximum values. AVG, which finds the average value of a field. So if you have, you know, 30 entries, and there's varying numbers in there, you give it average, it gives you an average of those values. Uh, sum lets you add stuff up. Now those are the most common ones people use. Postgres actually has 14 more. Uh, it'll do the min, it'll do means, it'll do um, all the normal stuff you expect for you know, typical math. Um, it also has specific um, functions for stats. So if anybody here has ever studied stats, you should go look up the stats functions in Postgres because most people that do stats usually import data into this piece of software called, I think, was it called Mathematica? And yeah, somebody giggled when I said Mathematica. And there's another one, I don't remember what it's called, and it's nightmarish because you import the data and then you it walks through the data and it does the stats. Or you could import it into Postgres and get it to do it for you. So it has tons of aggregates, but those four are the ones, that, that set of four, I treat min max as one because they're the two sides of the same thing. Um, those are the common ones you want to play with. Um, now, aliases, actually I should, show you guys a bit of aggregates before I get much further down the pipe. Okay. Now, this is something I showed you guys last week, which was select star from customers, which you can't see down here, but there's lots and lots of rows that get returned. Um, technically, if I jump to the end, you can see that there's uh, 10,100. On the other hand, I could go That was weird. When I hit run, this gives me just one number, shows me how many rows were returned. End of story. And that, you know, that's an aggregate function. The, however, some of the more useful ones would be um, when you're talking about dealing with um, real numbers. And in the ThinkCube database, there's a table called order lines. By now, you guys should know what an order line is, I hope. Otherwise, assignment one was completely wasted on you. So if I go select star from order lines, and I hit go, you'll see that you got some da basic data in here. There's some prices and some extended prices. And this normally should be, you know, this times this equals this kind of thing. And there's orders, uh, orders in here, order IDs. Now, if I were to turn this around and go, like that, so we can come down to a slightly smaller subset. Now we just got the order ID and the extended price. Now, how do you calculate an order total in real life? How do you know how much you, you're supposed to pay for something? Uh, the subtotal before the taxes, sure. And how do you get the subtotal? You add up everything you had in your order, right? In this case, it's my extended price. So if I wanted to, I could go
some of extended price. Now I'm going to try to run this and it should give me an error, which it did, which is very, very small and you guys can't read it, but let me read this for you. Error, column, order, I, order lines, out order ID must be appear in the group by clause or be used in an aggregate. Unlike MySQL, Postgres requires you to actually include any non-aggregate columns in the group by. MySQL is special that way. It says, I don't know what he wants, so I'll pick the very first column and we'll use that as our summary total, whether it's right or not. So you ask it to do a sum, it'll just give you one number. And it says, by the way, order five is this total. It has absolutely nothing to do with reality. It just imaginates numbers. So the group by clause says, I'm going to create bins. So and, did you guys ever, anybody in here ever have to tally totals for things where you did a survey and you had to count how many people answered yes to question one, you know, on a scale of one to five for question two. And essentially what you do as you're doing the surveys, you're creating bins, adding up in each of the bins. Or um, if ever you did a charity drive where you had to actually separate the donations into different piles checks, credit card, cash. Normally you want to put into bins. That's what grouping does. So I'm going to create this query and what it's going to do is I'm going to select the sum of the extended price but I'm going to create bins organized by order ID. So for every single unique order ID it's going to add up all the different extended prices and put them in a bin. So if I were to run this as is you'll see that you'll see order ID 25, 330, 513.55. That's its total. And that's, you know, 31, that's its total. 32, that it's, that's its total. Yes? So is that just like if there's multiple order IDs that are the same, it'll sum up and price? Yes. So for every extended price, for every order ID, it'll sum it up and make a bin broken down by order ID. And that's what grouping does. You can group by multiple columns and it'll just create sub bins for each one. Uh, if you've ever played with Excel and done sums, but your sums depend on other conditions, that's the same idea, conditional sums. Um, so that's the extended price. Now what's really cool though is you can also ask what, what is the average extended price? And you can do actually do two aggregates at the same time side by side. So the, the, the thing is it's not going to be particularly useful because if you can see here the order ID is 122 and end up being 122.87 again and if you're curious why that is So here's uh, basically what's happened. In this order, there was one order line for 122 bucks. The average is still gonna be 122 bucks. This one had five items in it, total of 848.44, but the average was 169.688. So essentially it took this number divided by five and that gives you the average. So in theory, you could actually do the math manually if you wanted also, but way better to get the server to do it for you. And Honestly, there's not much more to aggregates than that, is learning which one you need to do certain jobs. Sum adds up the values, average does you the average, count, well, counts. I think that one's pretty self-explanatory. Um, I could actually give you the min and the max. Not necessarily the most useful, query, but it'll show you right here that this order line has three things in it. This is the sum, that's the average, the min is 1070, and the biggest one was $389. So these are all the pieces of math that you can do on this order line. Um, as you can see, you can run multiple aggregates at the same time. There is one thing you cannot do, and I don't have a slide that says this is one, this one you pay attention to. You cannot aggregate an aggregate. So let's just say you want to know what the average order total is. So, so far, we know that if I grab this, 
this. That's, our, that's my order total. And if I want to know what the average is of all the orders put together, the logical thing would be, well, let's go average of a sum. And I'm going to run that. And it's going to say aggregate function calls cannot be nested. Here's why. The aggregate function happens at the end. So what it does, it'll retrieve all the records. It'll loop through the records, do all the math of the aggregate function. And now the process of creating an uh, the, uh, doing the aggregates is done. Now you're asking it to do another aggregate. Well, you can't because it's already been done. Um. There is a way to do it, but that's not it. No. There's two ways of doing it, and uh, both of them come later in the lecture periods. Uh, one is called using a derived table. The other one's a common table expression. And common, t common table expressions is not something we teach in this course because it's really over the top. It's like, you know, an advanced database topic, but the um, derived table I will be teaching, uh, depending on how, how time permits, either today or first thing next week. Um, you cannot aggregate an aggregate. It's just something you can't do. So if you get a question that says, well, I want the average total, too bad. You can't do it in one step. You can do it, but just not in one step. All right, so this is an aggregate, and this is going to lead me to the next slide. Aliases. Aliases are used to rename objects for the duration of the query. You're giving it a temporary name. So for those of you that wonder where the word alias comes from, it literally means the same thing as an alias in the English language. It's an also known as a temporary name. You can rename fields or tables. Um, field renaming is a good way of ensuring valid field names when it's the data is being retrieved by a program, uh, something written in Java or PHP. Uh, because sometimes you may end up with some really weird field names that may not work out so well. Um, and if you start doing joins, which I'll be talking about towards the end of this class, the renaming becomes important because it lets you give names, table names, shortcut names, so that you don't have to type in the big table names. And if you're renaming a column, you have to use the keyword as with whatever the column name is. And then if you're renaming a table, you don't include the as. And once again, it's like people were sitting in separate rooms not discussing how they should implement some of this stuff. Um, I'll show you guys what the aliases look like. So when I run this, see we have order ID, count, sum, average, min, max. Fantastic. What would happen if I wanted to also sum some quantity and now I have two columns called sum. Depending on what languages you've played with in the past, I can guarantee that some languages don't like receiving two array elements with the same name. So most program languages, when you access the database, when you ask it for a result, it'll read the first row. It reads the column headings for that row, and it creates an array for you to work with. I'm simplifying. but. Let me guess, you haven't learned what arrays are yet, have you? No, it's this semester. Trust me, it is this semester. It's just not for a couple of weeks. Okay, an array is a list. Let's go with that. Uh, it, but in this case, it creates a named list where each item in the list has its own name. If you have two things with the same name, depending on the programming language, one of three things happens. One, it blows up. That's pretty much every C-like language. Two, it accepts the very first one it finds, known as Python and Perl. Or it accepts the very last one it know, it sees. This is PHP and, Py and Ruby. So if it sees some, it'll only give you the second one if you're trying to access it by name. If you're accessing it by column number, you can do that, but you have to know what the column numbers are. 
On the other hand, you could give it an alias. Okay. It is, and I'll show you how in a minute. And there's a bit of history with that too. All right, that's good enough. I'm going to rename those ones. So now you'll see that it's been renamed to nice column names that are easily identifiable, that make more sense to what's there. Now, I don't know who it was because I was looking down that asked if I could put in spaces. Yes, there once was a time when a report was run, they came out on a line printer. And if those, if you don't know what a line printer is, go Google that and watch a video. It's kind of amazing how much paper can chew through in seconds. Um, when I went to school, when we output our queries to hand into the teacher, we redirected to the line printer that was in the classroom. For about 20 minutes of every day, you could not think because it was so loud. But they required us to make it look pretty. So as if we just demonstrated to a manager. So instead of total quantity, we'd have to write it nicely so it had n visible titles. So we'd go Am I going to do that right? Is that going to work? Oops. Yes. Yeah, you have to basically you have to quote it uh, with the object identifier quote marks. So in Postgres, double quotes says this is an object. In MySQL, it's the back tick. That's the thing above the tab below your tilde key. In Microsoft SQL Server, square brackets. So no, that's a string, not an object. Single quote is a string. In MySQL, double quote's also a string. Backtick is object name. In Postgres, double quotes is an object name. Single quote is a string. In Microsoft SQL Server, quotes are quotes either way. They're the same thing. Except if you want to make it an object identifier, square brackets. Every database server does it different. Uh, except for Postgres and Oracle. They actually agree what they should be called. And then I'll get rid of the rest because it's going to get long. And I'll hit run. And now here's, it's showing me qu double quote marks here because, you know, there's spaces in it. But if I were to output that to a text file, it would look pretty. It would look like a report that a manager would want to look at without having to think about it too hard. So back in the day, we used to actually put these nice titles and send them to a printer directly. We'd redirect the output. Instead of going to our screen, it would go out to LPR2. And next thing you know, you'd hear this sounds like a machine gun going off in the corner of the room, and you'd race to hopefully grab your copy before somebody else stole it. So that was you know, how we'd do the reports. And that's still some places are like that nowadays. But this is literally what they call an SQL report. So if you ever hear the term SQL report, that's it right there. I made it look pretty. Um, and the other one is renaming uh, database objects. So instead of order lines, I could shorthand it to OL. Now, did you just know, if I, let me take that away. Now, watch, watch the query, because that's one of the reasons I picked this editor for this lecture. If I go OL, do you notice that order lines went red? Because it doesn't recognize it anymore. What's happening is, for this query, order lines is being renamed to OL. Therefore, it no longer knows what this is. Let's see, OL is OL. And now it's been renamed for the duration of the query. Order lines was not renamed permanently. It's just renamed as long as this query is running. So I can keep running it and, you know, stuff happens. So it runs in 108 milliseconds. 23 milliseconds to actually pull it back. 
So those are aliases. They're really handy. And this is handy when you start doing joins. And that is, you know, how you rename columns. All right, now there's a few other functions that are useful to know other than aggregate functions. I usually throw the function talk in at the same time as the aggregates because, well, aggregates is not a hard topic to understand. You do it, it's grouped, stuff happens. Um, there is actually one more thing about aggregates I want to show you guys, but I want to get some of this other stuff out of the way first. Uh, string functions are used to manipulate strings. Surprise. You guys have started learning about string functions in Java, right? Trim? Does that ring a bell? Length? Okay. Trim? Get rid of spaces, you know. Pad? Pad to the left, add spaces to the right, left, that kind of stuff. Most programming languages have very similar functions. Here's some of the more useful ones. Postgres, by the way, has like 30 string functions. Lower and upper. I've already shown you guys about lower on how to make searches case insensitive. Well, there's the opposite, which is upper. Makes things uppercase, lowercase. Trim. Trim is handy. It removes um, characters. But unlike trim in Java, which removes white space, this lets you remove any character you define. So if you know that, you've got a field that always ends in, I don't know, Z. You can actually tell it to trim the Zs off all your strings. So you can choose to remove leading, trailing, or both. And then you tell it from what string. Uh, substring lets you split a string into multiple pieces, I guess. Um, in Java, that's equivalent to split, I think it is. Uh, position lets you find where certain characters are in a string. And length is, how long is it? Um, it's really not that mysterious. Um, let me go and mess with the customer lines here, the customer names. So here's our name. And right now we don't have any spaces. Um, but I could go trim both n from name. And it'll get rid of everybody's ends at the start and the end. As you can see, this does not look like a Java function. It is significantly more verbose. By verbose, I mean it uses more words. But you could actually read a trim from both the letter n from the field called name. It's fairly legible once you actually understand how to read it. Um, or you could go uh, trailing. So you'd only get rid of the trailing n. So anything that gets rid of the last n in the name, which is kind of cool. So it got rid of that. But anybody whose name starts with n would be unaffected. So that's trim. Um, I could go. Position of space in name. And I got that wrong because I'm used to thinking in PHP. For where's the position of space in name? Literally, in name. Go. Now, it's giving me a number, an integer back. It's saying it's finding, let me just put in the word name in here. The space is in position six. One, two, three, four, five, six. In SQL, in all databases, strings are not zero-based. They're one-based. The first character is in position one. In Java, the first character is in position... This is where SQL breaks your brain. Um, because, you know, it actually tries to be smart and it says the letter is in slot number one, because it is. It's a lot more literal and, you know, linguistically nicer. Um, it just goes back to the fact that SQL originally was written for managers, not for programmers. But then discovered it's still too complicated for the managers. But, you know, they kept a lot of that mentality. 
Now, some of you might be wondering, what's the use of the position command? <coughs> and so the position finds where a certain character is. Well, let's just say I just want to know what the person's first name is. I could go, there's another command here that's useful called substring. I could go sub, whoops, a substring name from 0, 4, the position. And let me grab this here so I can make sure you can actually visualize what's happening. And I'm going to run this and hope I didn't make a mistake. I got the person's first name. So it finds the position of the space. Now, the, the ticket is, though, that it, it when, although it's not showing it in here because that's actually a quirk in the software, is it, the space is actually included for the ride. Um, it just doesn't show it. But there is a space included. Because technically, from zero, or actually I could go from one, doesn't make a difference. It'll give me the same result. And if I do from one, you can see there's the space. From zero is cheating. I'm taking into account the fact that it includes the last position. So you can see here's our spaces included at the end of the N. So at this point, you do one of two things. You could choose to trim Uh, could not take in such arguments. Of course you can. Cool. Oh, that's because I'm stupid. Hold on. Dan had a stupid. There we go. I shouldn't be feeding it an integer when it's a string. And now I've trimmed my my name so it's now doesn't include the space. As you can see, you can nest functions to your heart's content. And you know, there's no real limit except for the fact that every time you nest a function it adds overhead. Yes? Yes. You know, you could give it a stupid name like that. You know, you can get clever with it, or disturbing. Um, but you can nest your, your, your functions to your heart's content. These are the most common ones you'll see. Yes. Because Postgres is nice, and it actually accepted the fact that I was stupid. It accepted me for who I am. Technically, you're supposed to have the as. And if you don't do it in MySQL, it will blow up. If you don't, do, and I think Oracle will accept it, but Microsoft SQL Server will not. So, yeah, it, I, it was me being lazy. So here's our happy little function that I just ran. And I've aliased everything. It's got a name. We've actually managed to extract the person's first name. So it's not 100% accurate, because if the person has a space in their first name, like Bobby Joe, then it's, that's not going to work, but at least you got a good chance to get it. So those are your common string functions. Those are the most useful ones you'll find. Um, like I said, there's tons. There's one called concatenate, which lets you glue stuff together. Um, but Postgres has a way of concatenating. Um, there's another one that's handy called coalesce. Coalesce detects if you have a null and lets you put in a character of your choice, which is handy. Um, date functions. There's a function called now. It shows you the current timestamp. Looks like this.
There. According to my server, it's uh, 11.36 at night because it's set to GMT. That's okay. It's not time to go home yet. Um, that's now, I've already shown you guys extract, which I did during the demo during talking about dealing with dates uh, last week. Uh, so I'm not going to show that one again. Um, and you can also do something kind of cool. If I go, really, we're going to do this to me now? So, I've got a timestamp. Do you notice I'm not even pulling from a table? I'm just getting it to do stuff for me now. I just told it to add three days. And you can see that I'm doing this, the, the cute little uh, casting thing. Uh, I showed you guys that last week. I basically put, I'm taking this string, I'm telling it to treat it as a timestamp. Then I'm taking this string and telling it to treat it as an interval. What is an interval? It's a, an amount of time that has passed. It's the, day, the year, the day, it's totally relevant. I could go plus three days, plus four, hours, that's also an interval. So in theory, there we go, it just moved up another four hours, yes. Uh, like, like this? Out of range. Because it's not a valid timestamp, so it's out of range. There's no such thing as 37 hours in a day. Actually, depending what year, February 30th is a valid date. There is a such thing as a February 30th. It happens once every 114 years. Um, I have no idea. No, No idea. Let's see what happens. It says you suck. Yes, if it's an actual real time stamp, which is good. You can, it's, it makes sure you can't be completely stupid. Um, unlike MySQL, I like writing on MySQL because MySQL is really dumb. Do this. Put in sep Put in September 31st into MySQL and it'll let you do it. No, really. MySQL lets you put in an invalid date. And it says, that's cool. I got no problems with that. How do I know? Because um, ThinkCube used to be on MySQL and I actually had invalid dates and I had a question that says, how many things happened on such and such a time range? And depending on how the person typed in the ant, how the person wrote the query, they get different numbers. Which is bad. September 31st. There's no such thing as September 31st. September has 30 days. Put in September, just let it go, create a table that allows you a timestamp, a date time, sorry, and put in a uh, September 31st. As of MySQL uh, 8.0, it still allowed it. So different database servers treat dates differently. Postgres is very strict. So is Oracle and Microsoft SQL Server. Toy databases let you do bad things. I shouldn't make fun of MySQL because it's in use everywhere, but it's such a bad database server. All right. The next one is numeric functions. Guess what you use numeric functions for? To work with numbers. Most functions, similar ones you find in programming languages. 
There you go. Absolute. Mod. Figure out your remainders. Rounding. Rounding. Pay attention to the round function. It's probably the most useful function on this page. If you, you should really learn how to use the round function. It will be very helpful during the practical exam. If I didn't get that clearly the first time, you should learn how to use the round function. Floor. Floor gives you the whole number without decimal places. It's basically truncating a number. There's also one called ceiling, which basically takes, if it's 2.1, it becomes three. Ceiling rounds up, floor rounds down. Ceiling. Ceiling. If floor is the bottom, the ceiling is the top. <coughs> yeah, no, not in this. It's verbose. He wants you to use all the word. And then there's random. Generates a random number between zero and one. And by that I mean it'll generate like a float between zero and one. Um, I will demonstrate the round function just because that's probably the most useful one on this, on this one. Okay, if I go back to this one. See right here, my average is nice and long. So this is this guy over here. So I'm going to get rid of these two. Because you know that 171.183333 rational number, managers don't like numbers like that. They don't make sense because they're rational, right? So. If I go round, and I don't give it any extra arguments, it rounds it with no decimal places. It'll round it up, it'll round it down. And I can guarantee the computer can round better than you can. Once again, during like a practical exam, if the thing tells you round it to do decimal places, don't try to do it in your head. I've had students lose points because they put in the wrong answer because they did it in their head because they don't understand how rounding works. On the other hand, if I wanted to round it to do the two decimal places, I can go comma two. And now we have a nice rounded number that looks like money. 1.18. Now if I were to take, uh, take my rounding back off, so I'm going to actually grab this so you can see what it's actually doing once more, one more time. Uh, 125 goes to 13. 246 goes to 25. Two six, no, dot sixty two six goes to sixty three. It rounds successfully. Round is handy. So the command is round, followed by how many decimal places do you want to round it to? It's not that complicated a function. And the other hand, handy one is floor. So if I were to grab this here. Put my comma, put the floor, and I run floor, <coughs> you'll see it includes a decimal. It includes the whole, the whole number, no decimal places. It basically rounds it down regardless of where it is. Where it normally would round, it'll always round it down. Also known as it truncates the decimal places off. If you did a ceiling, it sends it the other way. So it rounds it up regardless which is basically how I round the grades at the end of the term as I ceiling everybody's grades. If it's a zero mark, so it's zero. It'll just be... Uh, no, at zero, zero doesn't need require moving. It'll leave it alone. That's exactly what it'll do, just leave it alone. So those are the common math functions. Okay, now I have one more topic to talk about before I talk about Joins, because joins really sucks to talk about. Well, floor drops the decimals. It's the same thing as rounding down, right? No matter what the number is, if it's 299.99 in your floor, it'll be 299. 
is the same thing as rounding down from 299.99 because it gets rid of the decimal places. If you're sealing it, it'll become 300. So floor gets rid of decimal places. So I know there's a few questions, that, for example, in the practical exam that say, by the way, I want the number without the decimal places. It's everything to the left of the decimal places. So if you floor it, you know, for a fact, you're getting it right. Um, just, you know, pro tips. Um, now, there's one more piece that needs to be discussed here. Um, I am going to get rid of this stuff down here because I don't need to get fancy. Now, so far, I've discussed the where clause. What does where do? Anybody remember what where does? Other than the one that works with SQL on a regular basis. Oh, they finally fixed it? Oh, congratulations, they finally fixed it. Yeah, it checks the conditionals. What's the purpose of where? It filters the rows before anything else is done. So when you do select star from order lines where, I guess if I go where order ID between Uh, and I actually forgot the where word, the word where. Okay, so what where will do is before you retrieve the rows, it limits the rows to that set and then operates. <coughs> Excuse me. And... It helps if you type it in right. So this is now retrieving 398 rows. So what it's doing is it's, it's filtering down the list before it does the math. So it's only doing the sum and the count on the rows being returned first. So you're saying, okay, well, this is the range I want you to work with. Then it does the math after it's already trimmed down the list. It's a bit like when you do a survey and you say, okay, well, I just want to deal with the surveys in Canada. So you go through all the surveys, pull out only the ones from Canada, and then summarize it based on only the people in Canada, which is fine. That's what the where does. However, there's one more filter you can do. It's called having. Having lets you filter on the results of the aggregate. So where happens before the math, having happens after the math. It lets you filter on the results of the math. So for example, on my count, I've got the number of rows, right? One item in the row, two, there's five, four, two, four. Having, what I can do is say, I want only the totals back for orders that have more than two things in it. So anything that's three, four, five, six, and on will be returned. Anything with less than three rows, also known as, you know, greater than two, will be dropped. And now we have 191 rows being returned. You can see this tiny little number right there, which nobody can read except for maybe the first three or four people here. This says 191 rows. And as you can look now, see the count? There's no low numbers anymore. It's only the higher numbers. This is handy for when you want to um, eliminate low-hanging fruit. So for example, if you know that you want only returns on people who have orders over a certain amount, you'd use having, because you do the math first, and then filter out the ones you don't want. So you get the server to do the math. Now, I've once written back in the day in my programming classes, we were given data sets that look a lot like this and we had to write programs to actually do this for us. Now, visualizing, you've been given a, a, a text file with a hundred lines of text in it with numbers 
and you have to write a Java program to loop through all the records, add them up grouped by order ID, calculate the average, and then exclude any who has only two, one or two entries. How many lines of Java do you think that would take you? I remember doing something similar when I had to write it in basic, and that was close to 150 lines of code. In Java, it'd either be, you know, 40 lines of code or 600, depending what kind of day Java's having. On the other hand, you can write it as a single database statement. Now, I get this on a regular basis where I'll have my, the sales manager comes to me and says, hey, I want to know how, which customers spent the most. And I go, okay, well, do you, what do you define the most? He goes, the customers that spent at least $10,000 with us in the last year. So I'd be writing something similar to this where I'd go, and I'm going to go with anybody who spent at least $500. At least $500. And now I've only got the big spenders. And now I've only got the orders that are more than 500 bucks. It excludes all the low-hanging fruit. It's handy. Which, now that I've demonstrated this, brings me back to a question someone asked me last week. And I said, make sure you remind me today, this week, but nobody's mentioned it yet. Somebody says, well, how do you know which people have more than their names repeated more than once? How do you find duplicate records? is basically what's been asked. It was, yeah. So if I go select name, comma, uh, count of name, but in here I'm going to go distinct name. Notice where I'm putting the, the, the keyword distinct? I wanted to count the unique names, not the whole row being distinct. From customers. Okay. I'm going to put an order by of this in descending order. Boom. And of course I'm having a brain fart. And I go go. All right, so if I scroll right back to the top, and of course it shows it only the first 500 rows. And that's not working the way I expected it to. because I'm stupid. I want to know repeated name, not distinct names. Distinct names only tells me the names that are in there. It shows me it counts it only the unique ones. Let's try that again. There we go. Now we got people with multiple copies of their name. Who's the mo who has the most common name? Apparently, Yenis Noel has the most common name. Uh, follow, including Thomas Clement and Clara Gay and Océane Pons. So, if I want to know who's got repeated names, I can go and this will tell me the people that have repeating names. And apparently there's um, 1,186. Too small for people over there to see but, um, yeah, believe me, it says 1,186. People over here can verify that that is the accurate number. So for people that want to know, how do you know if how many people have more their name more than once? That's how you find it. Um, in theory, I could find the first person that has that name. So now I can position, oh, the, so the first Kevin Arno is at position 668. In theory, I could actually now go find all the other Kevin Arnauds and nuke them because I don't want duplicated Kevin Arnauds. Everybody must be unique. And from, based on this, we could actually write some other queries that lets us purge the database of duplicate records. But this is the magic sauce that lets you find duplicates. A totally different purpose of having than what I showed you a minute ago, which was, you know, I want to eliminate low-hanging fruit on the orders. This lets me 
identify duplicates in the database. Or let's just say you want to find out how many people have the same phone number as you. You know when you go to a website and they say you're only allowed to have one entry per phone number or one entry per address? How do you think they figure that stuff out? You know, they do stuff similar to this. Or that's how do you think they figure out people have found holes in their security and they still manage to get multiple entries at the same phone number or address doing this. Um, having is really powerful. Once again, the where happens first, then it does the math, then the having happens after the math. Because having operates on the math, as you can see. The having has to deal with the aggregates. Order by happens last, because after everything is said and done, then it sorts it for you. But it's a handy trick. Okay. I'm going to talk about joins, the first two points today. Um, I'm not covering the last two, the last two because I'm going to cover those next week. Um, it all depends on how fast I get through the first half. If this goes well, I'll be done in half an hour and we can all go home. All right. <coughs> joins. Joins um, is a challenging topic. Um, I tend to cover it twice. <coughs> I cover it this week and then I'll cover it again at the beginning of next week just as a refresher. Um, joins, I'm just going to go back here for a second. <coughs> joins are used when you want to retrieve data from more than one table. So far, everything you've seen me do is coming from one place, right? I was working with customers, I was working with orders, I was working with order lines. But I never dealt with the order information and its order lines. Um, when you want to work with that, then you use what's called a join. Now, there's three kinds of joins. Well, there's more than three. There's actually like five. But there are three that a lot of people use. The first one is known as the inner join. It's the one you're going to use 99% of the time. It returns records that match in both tables. So. Remember so far I've been trying to pound into you guys the concept of, you know, primary keys and foreign keys and how, you know, the parent, the primary key from one table populates the child table in the foreign key. That's normally what you join on is the parent, the foreign keys to the primary keys of another table. Um, there are two syntaxes. There's the old syntax. So if you go Googling on, spend time to go Google or Bing or DuckDuckGo or whatever you want to use, and you ask it how to do a join in SQL, you'll get two different answers. You'll get the old syntax and the new syntax. I focus on the new syntax. Not that the old syntax isn't going to work, it's just it sucks. So why would you do it to yourself? The old syntax is, you want to select, so far you guys have seen from, like from customers, from table A comma B where A ID is equal to B under, dot A underscore ID. So that's the old syntax where the, the joining, what joins the two tables together is listed as part of the where clause. It has nothing to do with the where clause, it has to do with how you're connecting the table, so why is it part of the where? That's because of how it was implemented. You can thank Oracle for that one, by the way. Um, there's the modern syntax, which is considered what they call the ANSI standard syntax. From A, join B on, and you tell it how to join. And don't pay attention to the capital B, that's PowerPoint correcting me after I've already corrected it three times. And when you do an inner join, the keyword inner is optional. Now, I'm actually going to do de a demonstration. It's easier to, ex to show than it is to explain. So, so far, you guys have seen this. Come on, Dan. Not rocket science. 
I want everything from customers. However, what happens if I want to know all the customer's orders while I'm at it? So I'm actually going to pull back the customer's name and their city, just to reduce the data set that's on the screen. And now I actually want to know what orders those customers placed. So I can go inner join orders. And I got to make sure I don't actually accept this because it will auto complete it for me. Okay, so I'm going to select name and city from customers, and then I'm going to join orders, because customers have orders, right? On. The on keyword tells it what you see following this is what the point of commonality is. So when you join two tables, you want to try to join against across what they call a point of commonality. What do the two tables have in common? And Customers has a primary key, it's called ID. And orders has a foreign key called customer ID. The customer ID foreign key contains the ID of a customer. So when I do a join, this is the point of commonality. And I go go. Now, I forgot to include anything else. So I could go include orders.id and orders.order underscore date. Now, I'm going to actually cause an error to happen on purpose here. Now, it put a little yellow underline because this IDE is actually smart enough to actually know that I made a mistake. But I'm going to run this, and I'm going to show it. Of course, I'm going to have to read it because the text is so small. Column reference ID is ambiguous. Now, what does the word ambiguous mean? I don't mean in database. I'm talking about in the English language. What does ambiguous mean? Pardon? It's unclear. Unknown. So it's saying, by the way, ID is unclear. Which ID do you want? Because the word, the, the keyword ID or the column name IDs exists in both orders and customers. It's saying, well, you told me to give you ID, but which one do you want? It doesn't know. Therefore, you have to tell it to be, you actually have to tell it which one you want. And I want the customer ID. And it's customers. Now, if I hit run now, you will see that this person in Dublin place an order. This is the order number, and that's the order date. That's the customer ID. I should put an alias on this. Then we're going to give it a nice name. And now we can see that there's a customer ID and a name, a city, an order number, and an order date. And if we were to put in an order by, and I run it, now you'll see this. Amin Moulin likes to shop. One, two, three, four, five orders placed between 2015 and 2016. We have joined two tables, I was able to extract the orders. And some people are going to look at that and go, well, I don't know how useful that is. It's useful if you're trying to pull up an order list, see, you know, a person goes to your website and says, what orders have I placed? Well, you can pull up their customer record and show them these are all the orders you placed. Congratulations. You do it with a join. No point writing extra code if you don't have to, because the join will do it for you. However, what was the topic I just finished talking about? Just, you know, I tied it off about 10 minutes ago. Before that, I was talking about what topic? Functions and aggregates, right? And I cannot put this in here because that's not cool. And this. Now, and now it's getting the query is getting long. And I go run. And now it's just showing me one order count. That's not very useful either because it's only showing one order. However, if I were to get rid of these two bad boys, 
And again, get rid of it out of that group by. Now I'm going to run a report that says, Amin Moulin in Bremerhaven placed five orders. Zirin Noel in Fairbanks placed five orders. Jules Olivier in West Jordan likes to shop. He bought eight, he placed eight orders. These are useful numbers. Because in theory now we could actually start And I've lost my run button. Hello? Cool. So now it's I can sort it in reverse order and who placed the most orders. Apparently Nina Paul in Colline de Lutaway. Hey, look at this, somebody from uh, Gatineau. Likes to shop, bought 15 things. I placed 15 orders. This is where the joins come in and they get really handy because you can start extracting valuable data from other sources. Um, and some people will ask, you know, are you limited to only one? Where's my Nerf gun? There we go. You can join as many tables as you want. You're not limited to only one table per join. You can, have, you can literally join every table to every other table. You can find a way to make it happen. But now I'm going to join order lines. Um, and instead of, there's the orders, and I can also go, and that should just work. Where'd my run button go? That's so annoying. Ah, you gotta use the keyboard shortcut. Okay. So. There you go. That's a little more reasonable. So now what's happening is I am counting how many orders the person placed, and by the way, I'm counting the distinct order IDs. And some people might be asking, well, why do you need to count the distinct order IDs? And I'll show you guys in a second why. And the extended price. So now it shows me that this customer in this city placed 14 orders and spent a total of 5,800 and change. In a single query, I got everything I want to know about this person. Therefore, I can actually go after the high rollers if I wanted to. If I want to actually go Not on who placed the most orders, but on who spent the most money. And this Pierre Schmidt spent $9,700. He's my biggest spender. Yes. So, is there a way to specify which table or what you Ah, yes. As some of you have noticed, I'm specifying a table name sometimes, and sometimes I'm not. To be proper, I should be specifying the table name at all times. However, most SQL interpreters are smart enough to say the, the column called name, it only shows up in the customer. It's not ambiguous. I don't need to guess because it's only in one place. The only time you, you absolutely have to specify what they call a table prefix is when a column is ambiguous, such as an ID. Or if you are joining countries instead of city. So you want to know what the total sales are per country instead of by name. Therefore, maybe then you'd want to include the countries, which I'll show you guys in a minute, actually. Just show you guys how you can do joins and joins and joins to your heart's content. So I'm going to get rid of the group by here. But I'm going to go inner join countries on countries.id is equal to customers.countryid. And now I want to go countries.name as country. Include my comma. And I want to group by this 
here, and I'm going to get rid of the customer ID. So clean that up. And I'm going to hit run. Now, I can see that in the United States, 6,364 orders were placed for a total of $3.1 million. It's kind of cool. It's stats. Some people don't find stats interesting, but you know, when you start playing with data, it gets interesting what you can derive from it. So I know that I've spent that much in the States. And if I started playing with the dates like I showed you guys last week when I can extract it, I could actually do broken down by the months. So if I wanted to see what the average sales were per month, I could do that. By, it would give me a different row for every month, but I could tell it to break me down by month and by year. So that way you can actually watch the trends through the year as the numbers go up and down. There's no real limitations of what you can do with it. Eventually you can write a query that won't work because you're getting too fancy. But this is actually a pretty standard query. And all you have to remember about the joins is make sure you define the point of commonality. So from customers, join or inner join, because like I said, the word inner is optional. This is exactly the same thing. You tell it what you want to connect to and the point of commonality. This is where your diagrams are useful because the diagrams will show you what's related to what and how they're related because that's the point of the diagram. Um, otherwise, you have to look at the metadata of the database and see what you know the tables are called and what the fields are called, and then you start guessing. So that's a join or an inner join. The other kind of joins are left and right joins. These are special purpose queries. It allows you to grab all the data from one table and any unmatched data from another table. Unmatched. Let me demonstrate. I am going to go get rid of this. I'm going to get rid of this. And uh, like that. But any columns that are specified from orders, 
that don't have a value. In other words, Benjamin Gomez never placed an order, so he doesn't have a matching order ID. It will return a null. So it'll give you everything from the table on the left, and it's actually, it's actually positional. And then, you know, a glass of water is free. Then they leave. They never paid. They're non-paying customers. Businesses don't like non-paying customers. Um, a query like this is how you find a non-paying customer. That's a left join. If I were to flip this and turn this around and go right join, I'd... Orders, order lines. Orders is to the left, customers is to the left. Orders is to the right, order lines is to the right. It's the same order that happens in here. It's just if you're having a hard time visualizing.
We'd have CA, C2, C3, and you would build ourselves a deck of cards. It is not a common query. The only time you tend to use stuff like that is when you're doing a matrix. Um, so if you're trying to figure out a price,